I am so glad that you are all um, joining me this afternoon. Today we're going to be talking uh, about a subject that's, I, I, would, I wouldn't say it's controversial, but I would say it raises a lot of questions because a lot of people from different belief systems seem to love to argue over things that, of course, we can never know until we actually get there. And what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking today about hell, about the lake of fire. And one church says that if you die and you're wicked, you're going to go straight to hell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why churches love to say that. Okay. And, and then there's another group that says, no, you're not going straight to hell. You're going to purgatory. Or, no, you're not going to straight to hell. You're going to go straight to heaven. Okay, so everybody's arguing over whether there's a hell or whether there's not and all this. And, you know, here's the thing. No one, I mean, no one's actually been to hell yet. <laughs> so how do you know? <laughs> okay, but the Bible has a lot to say about that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to ask you all to clear the, the, the canvas. And I'm going to ask you just to consider one moment that maybe what the Bible says, what God says through the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, might be the actually the actual correct interpretation of whether there's hell or not. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think maybe we ought to trust what the Bible says? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna I'm not gonna take a lot of time to talk about this because I have been talking about little components of this judgment and and hellfire and all that in the past several weeks. But what I want to do is just really zero in on this concept of uh, what happens when a person dies? Do they actually go straight to hell and do people burn forever, eternally tormented, okay? Because that's what the cartoons tell us. This is what movies and, and Hollywood tells us. This is what churches through many centuries have told us, you know. So, um, and if it's not that, then then why? Why, why do we believe this way? Okay, so I'm not going to really get into the why we believe falsehoods or whatever, but how about this? Um, with all the craziness going around, don't you think we need a little dose of truth? Like if I could put truth in a salt shaker, I think right now we need to pour a lot more salt on our life, right? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a little bit today about this concept of Revelation's Lake of Fire. So before we begin, let's start with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pray now for your Holy Spirit. We pray for guidance. We pray for truth that we can see what you actually have to say about what happens after death and how you will deal with the wicked and not according to what we were taught through tradition or through um, books or churches or whatever, however we came to believe what we believe. Um, teach us now, Lord, from Scripture what you want us to know. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Okay, so as you can tell from my prayer, I'm more interested in what does the Bible actually have to say about hellfire and the lake of fire. And believe it or not, this is particularly relevant for us today as we take a look at the book of Revelation because obviously the book of Revelation talks a little bit about what happens in the end times. Well, a lot about what happens in the end times and what to expect. So let's start first with this question. When will the wicked be punished? Okay, so we know that there's going to be two groups of people. There's going to be righteous and there's going to be wicked. And one of the common themes or one of the common thoughts is that when a person dies and you're you're wicked, like you're you're clearly wicked. All right, there's no hope. All right. In other words, you've rejected God, you've rejected Jesus, you went out on a killing spree, you murdered, you raped, you did this person did everything horribly that could be done, and then that person dies. Okay, that, that would be like the number one candidate for hell, right? Okay. So here's the question. Let's ask God this question. When will that person, when will people like that, when will the wicked actually experience that fire, be punished in that fire? Okay, so 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 is very clear. Here's how it reads. It says, the Lord knows how to reserve. So in other words, there's a, they're, they're storing up, okay, to reserve the unjust unto a day, the day of judgment where punishment will be given out. So in other words, what the Bible is saying is that when a person dies, they don't immediately, if that person who is the worst possible person who has been possessed by the demon, by de the devil, and did all these horrible things, that person, when they die, they don't actually go straight to hell, okay? 
according to Second Peter, the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So there are three things we learned about it. First of all, God doesn't immediately punish and give reward at death. That's one. Number two, there's definitely going to be unjust, but they're going to be reserved for a specific time period, a specific day of judgment. So that's the second thing. So it's sometime in the future, okay? But the third thing that we realize here is that there is absolutely some sort of a consequence, whether you call it a punishment or, or what you want to call it. There's a consequence to our decisions. Now, God is a God of love. We know this. I've been talking about this literally for weeks, but not everybody is going to love God back. I mean, not everybody's required to love God. None of us are required to respond to God in love. There's many who will hear about this and just absolutely reject God. So my job is just to give you the, the message and then you have to make the choice for yourself. But if you choose to reject God, then you're going to be in this, in this group that will still have the same, will have a consequence. I mean, if you accept Jesus, you have eternal life. If you don't accept Jesus, well, there's a punishment or a consequence that is reserved for the day of judgment. Now, when is that judgment day? So we can just go straight into the Gospels. And as you look to John 12, 48, and you can write these texts down at Matthew 13, verse 40 through 42. So write that one down. You take a look at them and you compare the Gospels and, and they ask Jesus, when is that day of judgment? And here's what Jesus said. It's the same shall judge him in the last day so that judgment day isn't now it doesn't occur as people are going over through the through the last six thousand years of, of mankind it's actually the the wicked are actually reserved as we read in second peter and repeated again by jesus in john 12 that the same will be judged in the last day in other words they're reserved for a judgment day and when is that judgment day it's in the last days all right so whatever the last days are which we could be in the last days right now okay then it's reserved for that time in the future. If you look at Matthew, it says at the end of the world. So when is the end of the world? I don't know when the end of the world is. If I knew that, I would be like selling stuff and you know writing books and all that. I don't have a crystal ball. I am not a prophet. However, I do read the Bible and I can tell you that Jesus and the prophets of the Bible have given us signs about when the end of the world will come. And when will those be? Okay, you know, I gave a sermon two weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, you need to go back to it. It is a part of my three-part series, 15 Bible texts for the darkest hours. And in my second part series, and you can see that on the Chandler Media Ministry site, YouTube, or my Future of Hope YouTube site, or even in the Zips and Nuggets page, or even in the Future of Hope page, you can see... Um, that sermon in there and in there I gave some signs that are actually happening right now and when I say right now I'm talking about in the last two weeks so these signs could be happening that will indicate that we are getting closer to the culmination of what Jesus was talking about the last days or the end of the world where this punishment is going to be meted out okay now since the wicked are not to be punished in this hellfire until that judgment day at the end of the world Here's, the, here's, the, here's an interesting question that we rarely ever ask. How many lost souls are in hell right now then? Okay, because we tend to believe that somewhere at the core of the earth or maybe out in the fringes of the universe is this place that's eternally burning and that's where Satan dwells and he has a pitchfork, okay? And his demons are there and they're pushing people along in these endless chain gangs of doing nothing but maybe carrying rocks or something okay and there's fire everywhere okay that's the image that we're that we're taught and that's the image that we were sold okay but right away we saw that just in the first three verses of this this discussion that the bible gives a totally different picture that there is not this eternal hellfire burning now but there will be a hellfire that's reserved for the end time the end of the world well, if that's true, then how many lost souls are in the hell now? What do you think? Not even one. Okay, there's no one in hellfire because guess what? All the evil have been rested in their graves. So you think about some of the, the most evil people in history like Hitler and Stalin and the Khmer Rouge leaders 
and those who who um, perpetrated the most horrific um, genocides in the modern um, day and in the ancient days. Okay, where are all those guys at? You think that they'd be burning in hell right now, right? Nope. The Bible says is all those evil people have been laid to rest and they lay, there's not even a hell for them to burn in because it's reserved for the end time. Now, since the wicked do not go into that hellfire at death, where did they go? So we go to Job in the Old Testament, chapter 21, verse 30 to 32. And there he says, that he shall be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. So all of these individuals, whether you're wicked or half wicked or righteous or half righteous, when you die, the Bible is very clear that you're brought to the grave and there you will remain. You're going to stay there in that tomb until a time in the future when God will do a resurrection. The righteous will be resurrected to eternal life and the wicked will be raised for you know hellfire okay that the big the big punishment at the end time so we're going to talk a little bit more about that but i want to talk a little bit first just right at the very beginning i want to just eliminate this concept that when a person dies they're going straight to hell okay so very clearly the bible doesn't teach that now if there is a hellfire it's reserved for the end time it's reserved for the end days which we could be getting very close to that what happened to all the wicked people up to this point They've remained in the grave and they remain in the tomb. Okay, now what rewards do the righteous and the wicked receive? So the choices that we make determine the end result. So the choices you make now, there is a ripple effect of consequence that you're going to reap. Okay, if you sow good seed, you're going to reap good um, fruit and vegetables. If you sow weeds and you sow horrible things, you're going to reap horrible things. Okay. Same thing spiritually. What rewards do the righteous, your choices you make um, that get you closer to God, or the wicked, those choices that you made that made your, yourself wander further away from God? Okay, what rewards are they? Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us that those of us who work, okay, and make choices against God, the wages of sin is death. However, if you're going to receive eternal life, it is not anything that you can earn wages for. It is a gift that God gives you. Okay, so if you're going to work towards salvation, you're going to end up still being declared a sinner and you're still going to end up with death. So why are you going to work for your salvation? There's nothing you can do. All right, so how about just give your life to Jesus and say, Lord, cleanse me, help me because I'm a sinner. And then God says, I am going to give you a gift. And that gift, my son, is going to impute you with his righteousness. And you are going to be seen through the lens by God through Christ. Therefore, you will have eternal life. Do you see that? Now, it's all based on your choice, either death or life. And it all came down to one choice. Did you believe and did you follow Jesus and connect to him and try to follow Jesus and what he had to say? It's really a simple matter. Okay? Now, which death do the wicked receive in that fire? So now remember, it's this physical death we experience now is really not so much of a concern because we know that there's going to be a resurrection. We've talked about that in First Thessalonians and First Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus talks about him coming back again when he went back to heaven. Why is he coming back? To bring the righteous back. Okay, so I'm going to start. I'm, I want to talk a little bit more particular about the wicked. Okay, right now that group, and we don't really like talking about the wicked because it conjures up all of these these horrible scenes of mangled people and fire and burning and and brimstone. I don't even know what brimstone is. I heard it was like the sulfur that smells horrible and it keeps burning. Okay, but let's talk about that. Which death do those people, the wicked, receive in that fire? Well, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. And so Revelation says a lot about this. Revelation 21, 8 says that they are going to experience what we call a second death. Whoa, hold on for a second. I thought that we only had to be concerned with one death when I died physically. Nope. When we die physically, that is temporary. That we're just resting in our graves. The most important thing that God is concerned about is the death of the soul. The death of the spirit, okay? That spiritual disconnect from God, which eventually occurs when you reject God. So that is the second death that occurs 
according to Revelation. And when that fire occurs, that is what they're talking about. It is talking about the complete destruction of not only the body, the physical, but everything, the, the, the spirit as well, the spiritual aspect of it. Now, this is kind of, like, it should be blowing your mind right now because many people believe that you can't destroy the spirit. That you can't destroy what God gave you, that a soul is going to live on forever. But this is what, so I understand that and I know that there is that belief out there. But we need to ask God what he actually says because He he's the one who said that there's going to be a second death. I didn't say that. Okay, so what do we mean by the second death? Okay, many people say that souls never die. It's impossible. That, okay, though you die physically, your your spirit will become a light. You will join the universe among the stars, or you'll if you've had a murder and you're very um, you're not at peace. You're going to be wandering around in your house for eternity, um, being a poltergeist and scaring people and little kids, and you'll be a little ghost. Okay, is that what the Bible says? Okay, so we we believe many people are taught to believe that a soul will never die. That's why you believe in all these ghosts. Okay, but what does God actually have to say about that? Can a soul actually die? Now, you remember when I talked about how a person is created, God took the, the, the elements, the dust from the ground, and he breathed into him the breath of life. And then he became a living soul. So I'm talking specifically about the soul, not the spirit of God. And I want to make sure that we're very clear on that distinction. The breath of life that God gave, that spark of life that God gave, I don't know if it's an invisible life force. I don't know if it's electrochemical, magnetic pulses that got me going. Okay, I don't know because I wasn't there at creation and I'm not that smart. Okay, we can see and we can ask God when we get to heaven. But clearly that breath of life that God gave us is more than just breathing into a nostril. There had to be something that got the chemistry and the electricity and, the, and everything in us going, okay? So I'm not talking about that breath of life, but I'm talking about this concept that people have that when you die, you, you're floating around like a ghost and you're like the soul. You remember um, on, at Christmas time, everyone loves watching the Christmas Carol. And there you have, what's his, um, Scrooge's old partner? Um, is it John Jacobs? Or is that the song, John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt? No, 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 it's not him. Okay, you know his partner, the one who was all wrapped up and he was a chained ghost. Okay, he says, Scrooge, Scrooge, you don't be a Scrooge because I made my choices. Now I'm bound to these chains or whatever he said, okay? This is what we're told, okay? But what does God actually say? So I gave you enough time to turn to this. <laughs> Ezekiel 18 verse 4 and 20 tells us what? That the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Which implies then that the soul that does not sin, who gives her life to Jesus, will not die and have eternal life. So there you see in the book of Ezekiel, it's very clear that when a soul rejects God, a soul can actually die. Okay, so that apparition, that ghost or whatever, okay, it doesn't exist because it dies. Okay, now here's the thing though. I want to go back to those first few texts. Remember that when evil and righteous people die, they're just laid in the grave. They remain in the grave to the end time. Remember we talked about that. So what I'm actually talking about is what, what is this concept of like what's actually dying at the second death? And what I'm showing you here is I'm breaking it down and I'm parsing it out that what we're really talking about is not so much the death of the person in physical, but we're talking about the death in the spiritual. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about how God's fire destroys or the different kind of fire. Because when we talk about fire, we're talking about like, you know, we think of like candles and fire. No, this is a different kind of fire. This is a fire that is actually all consuming. It breaks down to not only the elements, but it can break down even those things that we do not see. Okay, the spiritual realm. So this is a different kind of thing that our mind can only conceive as fire, but it could be something a little bit more than that. So let's look at it. Revelation chapter 20, going back to that book again, verse 9. What does this fire do to the wicked? All right, so I want you to check this out, and I want you to notice this very carefully, because in these texts are are encoded some some very very significant truth that you need to consider, because this concept that we're burning in hellfire forever, or we're a ghost wandering around, or a star, okay, all of those things is not biblical. But what the Bible does say, and what we've learned so far, is that you have a two you have two camps: the righteous and the wicked. 
everyone is stored for the end time. At the wicked, when the wicked are, are punished, okay, look at what happens. What does this fire do to the wicked? It says that the fire will come down from God. It's coming directly from God. So it's coming out of his throne room, okay? And it's a different kind. We only can conceive it as fire. This is how John saw it. But something is coming out from God, out of heaven, and it did what? It completely devoured them. In other words, there's nothing left. When you devour something, like my wife, she's an amazing cook. And sometimes she's so good of a cook that I devour that food down where I'm licking the plate. There's nothing left. This is, this is the same thing here. When this fire comes down from God out of heaven, it, it goes to the wicked and it completely enshrouds them and it devours them to where you it's nothing left. Okay, but it's not just this text that says it. Take a look at 2 Peter 3.10. How big will that fire be and what will it do to the earth and the elements? So here, I put it up for you. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be what? Burned completely up. Now, it doesn't say the dirt and the trees. It doesn't say the waters will be dehydrated or like, um, um, what do you call it when it when you, when you burn water and eva oh, evaporate it? It didn't say that, right? It says the elements. What are the elements? The elements, if, you, if you've ever taken chemistry, you, there's a periodic table. And on the periodic table, it gives you the molecular atomic formulation for all of the base metals, all the base compounds, all the halogen gases, everything that is broken down to its electron, proton, and neutron state. Okay. Now, here's the thing. All of you scientists know this. When you, when you melt an element, what you're actually doing is you're breaking and tearing apart that basic compound and you're, you're destroying it at the subatomic level. In other words, when God brings out this fire from, from his throne room out of heaven to consume the wicked, it's going to be so deep that, that the earth, the elements like iron and gold and, um, and cobalt and silver, all the base um, halogens like um, bromine and, and chlorine and all of these, these base elements are going to be broken at the subatomic level, which John called melting. The elements will melt with that fervent heat, okay? So it'll be so, I guess, hot that it's going to break everything down into its subatomic level. The earth and the works that are therein will be completely destroyed. It'll be completely burned up. But it doesn't only say it there. Take a look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And it precursors, it's the precursor or the predecessor to the New Testament. And Malachi went into vision. He had this vision about what it was going to ha what was going to happen in the end time. So a lot of uh, what we read in Malachi really is a prophecy that corresponds with the book of Revelation in the New Testament, the last book of the New Testament taken with the last book of the Old Testament provides a really good balance on things like this subject. How did Malachi describe that fire? And what did it accomplish? Well, look at Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. He said that the day is coming that will burn as an oven. Okay, now the ovens that they had back then isn't like the ovens we have. Like I have a General Electric oven. You, you heat up these little coils and it gets hot and you cook your casseroles and you cook whatever you cook in there, okay? Um, no, the, the ovens that they had back then, you stuck a lot of wood in there and it was flames. And the more you fed into it, the hotter it actually got. And, and it was in clay, clay um, brick stone work kind of things, okay? So what he's saying here is that there's going to come a day that everything's going to burn just like as if it was put in an oven. It's the same vision that John was given of the last days when this fire comes out of, out of, um, out of heaven. Then he goes on and says that all those wicked people, so it's the same people, the same group of people that John saw is the same group of people that Malachi saw. So again, as you close out the Old Testament, Malachi was a prophet who was given a vision of the last days. As you close out the New Testament, John was given a vision of what would happen to the wicked in the last days. And they are seeing the same thing. Here, Malachi says, all those wicked people, all that do wickedly, will be so completely burned up, there'll be stubble. Now, stubble, if you burn something up down to stubble, it's just 
um, there's nothing left. It says that everything is going to burn them up. So it's as if the same language is being used between John and Malachi, even though, uh, was it four or 500 years separate them? So they never knew each other. They were not contemporaries, okay? Leaving them neither root nor branch. So in other words, if you look about a, at a tree and you look at a 20 foot, tr a foot tree, you know, the root system that goes down on a 20 foot to 30 foot tree is 20 feet down to 30 feet down. Well, this is going to be such a, a pervasive fire where all the earth is going to be burned up and all the works of mankind, it's it's going to be leave neither root nor branch. In other words, it's going to go straight down into the probably the, the very strata of the earth. It's going to just completely take off that whole everything, the the layers, okay? Now, will the fire finally go out or will it continue on? Okay, so that's the question. That fire that comes out, that hell fire, that lake of fire that we're talking about, how long is that going to happen? How long does it keep going? Because here's what, here's what we're told. Here's, you know, and of course, you know, like I said, everyone argues over this issue like, oh, yeah, there's a hell. Oh, yeah, this is going to burn forever. It's like, you know, first of all, does it matter whether it's going on forever or whether it's not? Probably not. Secondly, how do you know? I've never been there. Either have you. None of us have been to hell yet. So why don't we find that out later when we get there? Hopefully we don't get there. Hopefully we're just watching this happen, okay? But how about we just see what the Bible says then rather than trying to argue over all these like various points about what we feel. How about we just go to the Bible and say, Lord, what, what, what do you say about the fire that you yourself mentioned? Okay, so here's the question. That fire that we, we saw in Malachi in the book of Revelation and in the book of Ezekiel and Second Peter, when will it go out or will it go out? Does it finally go out or does it burn forever like we're told to believe? Okay, Isaiah 47 verse 14 is very clear. Here's what it says. It says, there shall not be a coal to warm it. In other words, there's going to come a point when that coal grows cold. That means it's not going to be lasting forever nor a fire to sit before it. In other words, this fire that comes out of the throne room of God is going to be quick. It's going to be decisive. It will devour. It will burn everything up, creating everything into stubble, melting every element down to its subatomic level. And there will not be a warm coal or a fire to sit at because it is going to be completely out. It does not go on forever. Just like that. Okay? So this concept, I mean, first of all, that is not even consistent with the God of love. I mean, think about it logically. Even if I didn't show you these verses, which the verses are very, very um, convincing, right? Here's the thing. Why do you want to believe that there's a hellfire? See, the church brought that hellfire concept to create fear in its believers, to get them to come to church and give money and to, to follow what they say out of fear. This is not the way of God. God is a way, God is a God of love. We do things because we love God, not because we fear God. Certainly not because we're in fear of fire and brimstone, because clearly the Bible, now I know this is provoking. I know that you're saying, wow, no, no, I can't believe this because I actually want to believe in hellfire. Whatever, if you want to believe in hellfire, I guess we'll find out when we get there. I know there's going to be a hell. I know there's going to be a fire. But what I'm arguing is that this fire is not going to go on forever. That is not consistent with the God of love. It just doesn't make logical sense. Why would a God of love who sent his son to die want to torture people forever out in the fringes of the universe or at the core of the earth? Okay, first of all, the Bible doesn't say that. But it, logically, it just doesn't even make sense. Okay, so the Bible's very clear, though. It says that on that day, when punishment is given and the wicked are just, you know, destroyed, there's not going to be a coal to warm at or a fire to sit before it. In other words, this fire is not going to go on forever. Okay, it's not going to keep going on and on, and there's not going to be this na uh, gnashing of teeth and tormenting um, forever. What's actually what you read about that tormenting and gnashing of teeth happens at the second coming or the time when the wicked realize that they made a bad choice and they still rejected God. That's why they're gnashing teeth. The torment isn't because of the fire. The torment is because they 
knew that God was God and Jesus was from God and they still rejected it. And the torment of their rejection of God. And so God is going to consume them because they're not going to be happy in heaven anyways. Why would God want to keep people alive and, ha and, and live eternally in torment? Okay, there's no example of that in nature and there's no example of that um, in the Bible. And God is certainly has not shown to be that. You know who actually proved himself to be that way is Satan. Satan wants you to believe that that is what God is. And guess what? What Satan wants you to believe is what he is. Okay, things that you think about God is what Satan is. In other words, if it was up to Satan, if Satan was to rule the universe, you would be sitting in fire forever in torment. Okay, that is what Satan wants you to believe of God, and it's not true. Now, what is left when the fire goes out? So here we get this fire going on. It comes out of the throne room of God. We know that the fire goes out, but what is left when that fire goes out? Because we believe that, oh, maybe the body's burned up, but maybe these souls are floating around and they're in eternal torment. Do you remember that Disney movie with Hercules and, and all the souls were in this, like, eternal Hades and they're swirling around in hell? Oh! You're like this kind of thing and trying to get Hercules, you know, that kind of thing. Is that what the Bible says? Okay, that was a Greek mythology um, that they created. That's not even biblical. What is left when the fire goes out? Malachi 4.3 says that nothing's left but ashes. You know, have you ever done camping before? When we burn wood, I like to burn it so long and so completely that it, by the morning, there's nothing, man. There's there's nothing but ashes. And I'll even take the little logs and I'll, I'll break them up into pieces to where it turns into dust. And when you mix that dust with dirt, it actually creates really good fertile soil. <laughs> but there's nothing left. I don't know what, what I burned in there. I mean, I knew I threw in a paper plate. I don't see the paper plate anymore. I knew I threw in some some food items in there i don't see those anymore i knew i threw a ton of logs in there and kindling gone it all is just all dust ash that's exactly what bible says is going to happen in the last days nothing but ashes remember that this is going to be so pervasive it's going to melt it down to the to the to the elements now david in the psalm says that in a little while while the wicked will not be found no matter how diligently one may search for them what did he say was the reason so David's saying, you can look around for the wicked. Where is the wicked? I want to look for you. I want to talk with you, but I can't find you. Why? Why can't you find the wicked even after they die? Psalm 37, verse 10 and 20 says, because into smoke they will consume awake. Okay, so in other words, they're just going to, they're gone. You can't find them anymore. They're not ghosts. They're not people that, um, eternally in hell. The Bible says that into smoke they will turn and they will consume away. Okay? You know, I bring this illustration up. I, I like using my candle. See, it, you're, you're actually in my study here and I have candles. And when I, when I study, I sometimes, and I pray particularly a lot, I burn my candles. You know, this candle used to be this big. When I burn this candle, this is wax. And it melted the wax. I, there's no wax in my ceiling. There's no wax on my ground. Where did the rest of this candle go? Well, you say it burned up. Well, where did it burn away to? It burned away into its elements. It burned away and it's floating in the atmosphere. I, I can't touch it. I, it's gone. It's, it's completely gone. Likewise, at the end, when God burns and when, when, he, when he purifies and, and the wicked will receive. Now, again, I know this is very uncomfortable because we think about people and we think about family members and they might be wicked and, and you, you pray for them. I'm, I'm actually talking, um, this, this is why this is a hard truth because I like to talk about people who accept Jesus. But what about people who do not accept Jesus? So I'm just talking about this concept of hellfire. Well, here it says, into smoke they shall consume away. Okay, God's justice is complete, not because he was seeking justice, but because people have made their choices They've rejected God and they decided that they wanted to just do away with God. They were upset it and they're angry and they will never, ever love God. Okay, so let's talk about this justice. How long will the wicked suffer in the fire? Okay, so I've kind of alluded to that already. I mentioned it earlier, but here's your text. Revelation 22, 12 says that to give every man according as his works will be. So in other words, God is going to give every person 
the consequence of their own choices. Like if they decide that they want to reject God, then that's, you know, God is not going to force people into a robotic state of mind and say, you must obey me. And then I say, yes, Lord, I will obey you for the rest of eternity. You know, that's not God. Then that's not what we're going to be doing. So if a person says, I want to reject God, it's completely, that's your decision. That's that person's decision. But God's not going to like let you live out forever in in like a hell. He's not going to forever let you live in this torment that you made a bad choice. No, he's going to just take care of that. Just one false swoop. Okay. Now let's talk about the devil. When the devil is placed in that fire, what happens to him? And let me add to that, when, when the evil angels who follow the devil are placed in that lake of fire, what will happen to them? Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 and Ezekiel 28, 17 through 19 is very clear that they too will be brought to ashes upon the earth. So now when we think about ourselves, it's easy to understand because we have a physical body. And Satan and the evil angels, they're spiritual beings. So we're talking about something that will come out of the throne room of God that will be so pervasive that it is even going to be able to impact the spiritual aspect of even Satan and all those wicked and the evil angels. They will be ashes upon the earth. Will people enter the fire in a bodily form or as spirits? Matthew 5.30 says that the whole body will be cast into that fire, that hell, that lake of fire. Now, when we talk about the whole body, we're, we're talking about more than just the physical. The holistic body is the mind, the, the, the spirit, and the body. It's the union of those three elements. So all of that is going to be dealt with. Likewise, those of you who are righteous, I just want to put that to the side for a second. This is why you have to be changed at the second coming. Your whole body has to be changed. You're not going to actually carry this body. For me, that's a thank to God. <laughs> okay? Maybe I might be six foot tall. I don't know. Okay, but the, the physical, the mind, and the spiritual body, the holistic person is going to be changed. We're going to, be, um, go, we're going to go from mortal to immortal. We're going to go from corruptible to incorruptible. And we will be changed and brought up to, to God. And, and in that new body, we'll be able to survive and be able to live in the presence of God in his glory. We'll even admit our own glory, by the way. Okay, so what about those who are wicked? Well, that whole body is not going to change. They're just going to, it's going to be, as the Bible says, burned up to ashes, completely gone. Okay, it'll be cast into, into that hell fire, that lake of fire. Now, some say that the soul burns forever, and we've talked about this. You know, particularly the cartoons, and, you know, children are taught this, and, and you know, I don't like falsehoods being taught to my kids at all. So this is why it's important to me that they understand that God is a God of love and that if you respond to God, it should be out of love and not out of fear. And this whole concept of living and burning forever in this hellfire only institutes a falsehood and it's based on fear that Satan wants you to believe. Okay, well, some say that the soul burns forever and only the body is destroyed in hell. All right, let's let's put the nail in the coffin on this one. What does Jesus actually say? Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, Fear him which is able to destroy both, what? Not only the body, but the soul. That's the spiritual aspect of it. That, that the, the combination of the breath of God and the body. The soul can die. When, when, when the breath goes back to God and the body goes back down, you cease to exist. So Jesus is saying, the one person who can who can destroy you at a spiritual level is actually the him. You, you know who the him is? Fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the cause of Satan. Okay, Satan is the one who can actually convince you to believe in falsehoods and take you down a path that would lead to a consequence of this eternal lake of fire, this burning up. Okay. God is going to do all he can to bring correction, to say, you know, don't follow that way. Come back. And it's a gift that he gave you. Remember, I told you there's just two choices. One is really simple. You just accept Jesus, receive eternal life. The other is rejecting God and receiving the wages of what you do. And that is death, sin. Okay. Now, Satan misrepresents God all the time. And I always like to say, if God has a truth, Satan always has a counterfeit. So in other words, 
God created in six days and he created a seventh day Sabbath as your memorial of his being the creator, the God of the, the universe, the one who created heaven and the earth, right? Satan's going to have a counterfeit. So he likes to have everyone believe that the earth evolved over millions of years, okay? And then he has everybody worshiping on different days. Interesting that he takes the focus away from the Sabbath. Why is the Sabbath such a big deal to so many people? I mean, it's just a day, right? Well, the day is important because it's your memorial that God is your God. And Satan doesn't want you to see that. Well, likewise in Hellfire, God is very clear. If you choose to not follow God, you're going to be burned up. You're going to be consumed. And, and that's your choice. He doesn't want to force you into a robotic love, okay? But Satan wants you to believe that God is going to torture you forever and ever. And there's nowhere in the Bible that even says that. This gnashing of teeth and this forever crying and everything is, is, is what happens when, they, when the wicked realize that God is just and that God is right. And it occurs at that second coming. But it doesn't say that these people are going to be burning forever. In fact, the Bible is very specific that everything's going to be devoured and burned up. Everyone lays into their grave at the end, until the end, on the day of judgment. Okay, so let's talk about this. What is Job's fitting question regarding God's justice? So, I, I like to lead off with this because a lot of times we always like to like um, come up with all these rationales because, you know, humans are smart. God gave us brains and we like to like wrangle our minds around what God says. But I want to remind us of this thing. Job 4, Job 4, 17 says... Shall mortal man be more just than God? I mean, we like to judge God all the time. How about judge Satan? Okay. And Job asked the question, can we as mortals have a limited knowledge base? How can we be more just than God? If we know justice, then don't you think that God is 100 times more just? That if we can mete out justice, God can even do it better? Okay, so the, the end question here is this. Whatever is going to happen, we're all going to be convinced that God is just and that there is no other choice for God to do. So this is why this is a kind of a tough one, but I just wanted to lay it out for you that whatever happens in the future, whatever happens in this hell and this lake fire, okay, at the end, we're all going to say, okay, everyone made their choice. We understand what happened there. Um, thank God that God is merciful and loving and he just did it quickly. He didn't have them burning up and, and, and tormenting forever. It was a fast thing. Remember, fires aren't even going to be existing. Okay? There's no, no fire to sit at, no coals to warm to. And you remember um, what we read there. Okay, so what do we read next? For whom did God plan the fires of hell? Matthew 25, 41. Of course, it is prepared for not only the wicked, but particularly the devil and his angels. So... Satan and his angels, his their days are numbered, and they know that. So they're going to try, you know, you've seen people, if they know they're, they're almost gone and they're on the way out, they're going to try to take out as many people as they can. So this is um, the strategy of Satan and his angels. Um, but they know that they um, have a punishment that is awaiting them. Okay? And God's love at the end, as I mentioned, is absolutely vindicated. What is God's act of destroying people in the fire called? Okay, so this is a really cool one. Isaiah 28 verse 21. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this text. And I want you to remember the question. This, this act of destroying people in fire, okay, is considered a strange work. A strange act to God. Because you see, it's strange because it is the antithesis of who God is. It is the paradox, the contrast, the opposite of what God is. Remember, it is the same God that sent his son to die for us and go through that humiliation and go through that separation himself out of great love and everything that God has gone through to save us. It is that same God that has to mete out this, this punishment at the end. And this is why when the destruction of the wicked occur, it's going to be a strange work and a strange act to God. And in fact, I, I can almost imagine God having to close his eyes and turning away as the fires are issued out and burning all the elements together for Lucifer and all the Satan, all the all the evil angels and all the wicked that absolutely hate and despise God. 
You know, I mean, these are people who actually loathe God. They hate God. They despise God. They want to destroy God. That's those people. But yet, Isaiah says that when those people are destroyed, I can almost imagine this strange work, this strange act of God, it almost probably would bring him to tears because it didn't have to be that way. Okay, and I can almost imagine Jesus looking at that and with his head down and saying, man, it was so easy. Why? Why? What did we do? You know, and you can almost hear him cry at that moment. And so out of an act of compassion and mercy, he's just going to bring it in. It's going to come out. It's going to be all consuming, melt it all down, completely devoured, burnt to stubble, burnt to ashes, nothing left. Okay. Now, when that new kingdom and after this fire, okay, what happens after that? What 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 is going to be the next evolution after this fire happens? Because remember, we're told that this fire just keeps on burning forever. But the book of Revelation 21 forces that when that fire comes down and it consumes all, including Satan and his angels and all the wicked, look at what happens next. It says that the former things are now passed away. So in other words, all of that pain, that suffering, that torment, the fire, everything is now gone. The tears, everything, the separation, the anxieties, all of the, the, the death, all of those former things are gone, including that hellfire. Okay, and what happens? Okay, well, what happens is Jesus sets up a new kingdom. So we get to see God recreate the world again. A new heaven is created and evil is completely, completely destroyed. Now, what should be my reason for serving Jesus? John 14 tells us that we do things, and I mentioned this many times already, don't do it out of fear, but do it out of love. Do it out of love. Now, think about earthly governments. You know, earthly governments cannot remain stable without the meeting out of justice, right? Because if you don't have laws, you're going to have anarchy. But yet, in spite of that, some even say that God is too loving to ever punish or destroy the wicked. Well, what does the Bible say? Exodus 34, 6 and 7 says, the Lord can by no means, will by no means, clear the guilty. He can't because there has to be a law and order. There has to be justice. There has to be a rule. There has to be a boundary by which everyone is has to make a choice. And here the, it's clear that you're either, either going to be a participant of love towards God and love towards your, your fellow neighbor or you're not. Okay, if you don't want to follow those things, then there has to be a consequence to that. And so because of that, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Now, there's a lot of victims I know who are watching this broadcast right now. Many people who were victims of violence and victims of abuse and certain crimes. Okay, I'm, this is hard. Don't judge these people. Leave vengeance to the Lord. God is going to, he will not clear the guilty. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it there. I pray for those people. If there's hope for them, God will try to find hope. But if there's no hope, you see what's going to happen to them. Okay, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Now, will sin ever rise up again after everything is destroyed? What do you think? Because we're still going to have our free will choice. We're still going to have the ability of, of like falling away from God, right? What do you think? Nahum chapter 1 verse 9 says, what do you think? Why do you even ask that question? Affliction will not rise up again the second time. Sin will not rise up a second time. Why? Because we already knew and we know what it what what happened. What does what occurs when we reject Jesus? When we decide that we're going to disobey? When we're going to um, we're going to we're going to know that God was a God of love. So sin will not rise up a second time. And this is a prophecy that you can bank on. Okay, the whole universe, the angels. Mankind will know that God is a God of love. And because of that, there will be no interest in trying to um, do a coup d'etat against God. There will be no interest in trying to dethrone God. There's no interest in saying, you know, God is horrible. I mean, how can you say that, especially after all that you were and what God did for you? And you're going to remember that. So sin will not rise up again the second time. That's a really good text. You should write that one down. Nahum chapter 1 verse 9. Now, what will God do after sin and the sinners are destroyed? So here I have three texts. You can write these down or just go back and review this. Isaiah 65, 2 Peter 3, and Revelation 21, 3. As we close out today, we are told 
that behold, God will create a new heaven. Because remember, everything on earth and heaven was melted down to its elements at its subatomic level. So guess what? We get to watch God do the whole creation again. So we are watching the genesis of our world, okay? And there is going to dwell righteousness. Why? In Isaiah 2 Peter 3 verse 13, God is going to dwell among us. And he says, God will be there with us. The capital city is where God's throne will be, and that is where our homes will be in the city. That is so awesome. Of all the created worlds, mankind gets to be the people, the created world that God will dwell with. I mean, Jesus is human, right? He was made like us, so of course, we get to hang out with Jesus, and we were created in his image. Among all the other created beings, we were special, and I want you to remember that. Don't ever diminish who you are. You are a child of God and you were bought with a price. And all you have to do is thank the Lord and say, Jesus, I give my life to you and I can't wait for that day when you come again. And you will dwell with Jesus in the same city where God dwells. Friends, Jesus is inviting you right now to live in that fabulous new kingdom. Are you going to accept his invitation and let him work that miracle in your life that will take you from where you are now and take you on a journey that will land you in the heavenly kingdom? If that's you right now, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that you blessed us today with this Holy Spirit to understand what the Bible actually teaches about this very difficult subject known as hell. But Lord, we know that what is more consistent is that you are a God of love that you want all to come to repentance and to recognize that we need you. And so, Lord, we come to you now. We take the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, as our own. And, Lord, we, as, you inter as your son, Jesus, intercedes for us, we come before your throne in his name to ask that you will see us as your child, that we will be counted among those written in the book of life, and that we will be counted among those as new citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Keep me and my family in prayer. As you know, uh, we are dealing, uh, we are deep in this coronavirus thing right now, but God is sustaining us. I'm taking, um, I'm doing a lot of things um, that um, the Bible teaches about how to deal with these kinds of things. And so far it seems to be working. So uh, keep me in prayer. I'll keep you all in prayer. Next week when we get back together, our next lesson on Saturday at 3 o'clock is going to be um, a new journey that we're going to be looking at. And it is, it is that mystic Babylon, the great harlot that is mentioned in the Bible. So we're going to unpack that and see who that is and why that's important for us in these last days. So until then, God bless everyone. And I hope to see you either in tomorrow's broadcast, Wednesday or Friday. Until then, God bless.